What happens when you, when you smoke DMT is there's an initial kind of handshaking confusion, like when two computers meet and exchange protocols. Uh, it, there's a 30-second period where everything sort of gets sorted out, and this thing forms like a mandala. I call it the chrysanthemum. And it's a s rotating orange-yellow floral circular mandalic thing. If you have not taken enough, it is a kind of like a kind of rubberized membrane or something. If you haven't taken enough, you'll hit it and bounce off and have this really ambiguous experience, which is pretty horrible, actually, just kind of a confusion which slowly goes away. But if you've taken enough, and the key to taking enough, and here comes a piece of practical advice that may be worth more than the entire workshop, the way to get off on DMT is after you feel completely peculiar, you have to do one more enormous hit. This is where courage comes in. Most people, they take it and they say, it's, it's working. This stuff feels really weird. It's really working. They say, do one more hit. And they say, no, no, it's working. They say, no, do one more hit. So then you do, or we say you do you penetrate that membrane and you go through a series of like, to me it's like a ramp, but it's like a series of diastolic compressions that push me forward. Birth canal analogy, obviously. And then I break into the elf dome or the hive, as I call it. And certain intuitions accompany this without any rationale. And one is, I'm underground. Uh, this place is warm, it's domed, it's reasonably well lit, but there's enormous weight above my head. I'm far under the earth somehow. And fairies, as we all know, live under hills. So then I'm there, and <clears throat> the elves and the elf machines and the language lesson are proceeding, but if I can stabilize and calm my hysteria so that I can maintain some kind of objectivity, I notice that really the place I break into is somebody very odd, someone very strange. It's their idea of a reassuring environment for a human being. Somebody who doesn't know very much about human beings, but who's really trying hard, built this terrarium of arrival. And it has the aura of a maternity ward. And I've thought, you know, these self-transforming elf machines, which I take so seriously and try to make the basis for a new ontology, they could be n nothing more profound than those plastic shapes that we hang over a baby's bassinet to teach it to coordinate space and color. In other words, what those things are is they're educational toys. They aren't the main clam. They're not in charge of the hospital. They're just something dumped in your arrival playpen to keep you happy while the doctors make the observation. And the doctors never appear. Uh, and the whole thing is pervaded with a wonderful affection and zaniness. It's completely life-affirming. I have no patience with alien abduction and any of that. I think that's pathology. I think it's media-damaged people manipulated by incredibly unscrupulous New Age weirdos. Uh, there is no paranoia in this. It's entirely positive, although very, very weird. The main thing it is, is hard to understand. What's this all for, you know? Maybe you thought you were going to have an insight into your relationship or resolve your hatred of your father, and instead you come, you're playing canasta with elves. Yeah. Is the experience progressive? Not very. It's almost, it's always the same. The emphasis is on imitating the language. And... So you don't sense that there's a breakthrough point beyond that? I mean, as, as you mentioned, passing through the membrane, getting into this environment, now you're in this environment, the exchange is taking place, 
you're dealing with it on a rudimentary basis, but you don't have any perception that there's an increase. Well, the problem is the brevity. We very quickly figured this out back in the 60s. You only get three minutes. It's like, you know, visiting the American Museum of Natural History for three minutes. So what we really need was an extender. And that was why we went to the Amazon in the first place, was because ayahuasca from the anthropological literature sounded like it was the extender. And in fact, if you brew it stiff enough, it is, and you can get in there for uh, quite a while, but it doesn't become particularly more rationally apprehendable. Um, I, 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 it, it's, it's a great mystery. It's a puzzle. It shouldn't exist. It's the thing which you don't believe exists. It it does. Yes. It's a crazy idea. You're talking about elves. I'm thinking about sandflies. And flying in a sled and having a red-nosed ranger and seeing in the dark and rangers eating mushrooms. And so I'm... Well, you, you want me to extend your list for you? Santa Claus's colors are red and white. Santa Claus is associated with the spruce tree. The spruce tree is the mycorrhizal symbiote of the Amanita. The Amanita is associated with magical flight. Santa Claus flies. The Amanita is associated with reindeer. He flies with the aid of reindeer. Uh, he, he, he makes gifts for all the boys and girls in the world with the help of elves. Elves, in all traditions, are, are what are called uh, demon artificers. They make things. That's what elves do. Whether it's shoes or gold jewelry, or they make things. Elves are artificers. Now, what else before I leave this theme? Ah, Santa Claus lives at the North Pole. The North Pole is the Axis Mundi, the Yggdrasil, the magic world ash of North, Norse shamanism grows at the North Pole. You pile all this stuff up and you say, this has got to be an ancient memory of an Amanita cult. Although I've looked at Santa Claus and I have never found a source that would trace it back further than the 10th century. But I maintain, you know, it's Paleolithic, probably. Uh, yeah. What's the probability of finding a new tryptamine that we weren't aware of that extends the trip, so to speak? Give one 30 minutes of time to get the language down. They also might be sort of, you know. Well, Sasha, you know, is now working on the tryptamines, and I asked him in Mexico, I said, you know, of all of these tryptamines you've elaborated, which ones are the most interesting? I can't remember the one he named, but uh, it was a synthetic, and he said it was extended. Uh, there's a certain, I don't know if fear is the word, but these places are really strange. And for most people, three minutes is quite enough. And, and then they need to uh, attempt to assimilate it. Part of the problem is you can't remember it. I mean, I've seen people smoke DMT, give all the presentation of intoxication, come down, lie still. And when you say, what happened? They say, nothing happened. Nothing at all happened. And furthermore, I think I won't be seeing too much of you in the future. Uh, in fact, I'm sure of it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. There's also a possibility of sort of the analog of going to the gym before going out and doing a sports activity, that one practices remembering dreams or trying to experience the weirdest sober things possible in order to have like the most stamina in the altered state. Isn't, isn't the dream uh, itself, the, the images, uh, a language. I mean, isn't there a form of? Isn't aren't your images communicating something to you through images? You mean in a normal in dream? A normal dream. There's, you know, there's the citizens of the dream yes. that come, and they, uh, I mean, depending upon you know whether you're visual or auditory or whatever, they're communicating to you as well. So you're watching 
you know, observing and, and participating and feeling, and you're getting messages at the same time. Well, and the dream world itself is, is very bizarre. I, I have recurrent dreams. A lot of my dreams are recurrent. And I had an experience recently. I was having a recurrent dream. And uh, it was basically, I was in a restaurant, and this guy was taking my order. And as I looked at him, I realized I had seen him before in a dream. And I said, I, I've seen you before but it's been a long, long time. And he said, yeah, well, I went to Alaska and worked the salmon boats for a while, but now I'm back. It's like, ah. Oh. So, you know. Uh, well, shamans would report that because they're, they're always interacting with the same power sources. That's what they said. They're getting new ones, but they're interacting with the power sources. That's right, yeah. Um, when you're talking about the, the images that you're when you're describing this, what happens to my understanding is it sounds like these are the keepers of the patterns of life in a sense. They're the keepers of the DNA or when, when something comes into life, a species or a species exits life, that there is a gathering up of, of the patterns and that the, that the life itself, we don't understand that realm or that form but maybe in this altered state that we get to go into and see what it's like to gather up patterns and, and, and in a sense illustrate to us what, how the patterns, because it's kind of like it's a joyous thing, you know, life in itself, and that, that the keepers would be something. Well, imagine how astonishing it would be if we could confirm that there was something beyond death and that in fact it was not only there was something but whatever this something was was actually looking back at us uh, i was raised catholic and took a lot of time to deconstruct this kind of stuff it did not seem to me rationally supportable uh, but actually that's in the light of a fairly simple rationalism now I look at nature, and everywhere what I see is that nature conserves novelty. This is something you'll hear me say many times. In other words, once nature achieves some structure, she is very reluctant to let it go. Uh, life is an example. Uh, life was achieved more than a billion years ago. And through asteroid cataclysm and polar reverse and solar dynamic, it is tenaciously, tenaciously held on. Uh, so it may be that this thing which we call the personality, the self, is actually of, of interest to nature as a complex structure and that it really does use the physical body as a kind of workbench upon which to build uh, a higher dimensional vehicle of some sort. Otherwise, it's very hard to account for some of what's going on. It, and this is one of the most confounding ideas that you could put forth in this intellectual environment, because if there's one thing that science has definitely put some effort into, it's exercising spirit from nature, you know. Nature is a soulless machine, according to science, without purpose, without intent, without will, without sentience. It's just happening. It's mutation grinding against natural selection, and that's all it is, according to them. Well, uh, evidence from the shamanic dimension seems to be uh, quite the contrary. By the way, this is what I intended to talk about this afternoon. I was not led astray. My notion of this afternoon was that what we would talk about is the various characteristics of novelty. This morning we talked about the methods, then you know the various characteristics of novelty, and DMT represents a concrescence of novelty. It is. Uh, the paradigmatic psychedelic, it's the paradigmatic dimension transiting uh, experience. Other 
descents into novelty are your own maturation, your individual experience of life. Hopefully, if you're getting older, you're getting smarter. There's no excuse for anything else. How would it be if it worked the other way? Uh, although for some people, they seem to manage that. Uh, so life, your life, is a descent into novelty as well. Leading, they all door, all these novel paths lead to the same door marked post-mortem. Uh, history is another descent into novelty and now that descent is proceeding at such a pace that we can almost physically feel ourselves moving into the future i mean we, we require daily newspapers and hourly updates to stay on the moving crest of what we have uh, <coughs> set loose so the individual journey through life toward death the cultural journey toward transcendence, eschatology, apocalypse, whatever it is, depending on the cultural style, and then uh, fractally embedded in these larger forms of novelty, the psychedelic experience, and uh, in the spirit of thoroughness, the sexual experience, which against the background of ordinary life and activity definitely represents a, a nexus of, of novelty and focus. So all of these things are descents into novelty. And then I maintain on a still more micro scale, this period of time we're experiencing between the end of February and midsummer, a similar thing that these patterns repeat. And sometimes they're extremely dramatic. I suppose death itself being the most uh, dramatic example because basically that's the trip from which you do not return uh, and so forth you're aware that friday was the biggest single change in financial markets in the last seven years no i flew thursday what happened friday well the, the stock market lost 180 points uh, the bond market had a disastrous the market fell how far? 180 On Friday. Well, they must be shitting white over the weekend. What's going to happen Monday morning? Right, Monday's a big day. Well, I, I, I win! <laughs> <laughs> Not that the stock market is the revelation of God's holy will for mankind, but notice that what is interesting about the stock market, even if you don't give a hoot about money or capitalism, is that it's an effort to mass average change. It's an effort to give you a very large scale picture of many, many opinions brought into uh, a, a final um, um, recension of some sort. So in a way, it is like the time wave. It is, and uh, just to further your, your thought, um, the great article in The Economist from last week, International Magazine of Finance, that put a statistical correlation now on all of the world's markets becoming interlocked. All the big uh, developed country markets are not acting independently of each other as they used to. The, the rubber band force is becoming much tighter well, see, if they would study dynamics, this wouldn't puzzle them at all. That's a well-known phenomenon in dynamics. It's called coupled oscillation. The simplest example being walk into a Swiss cuckoo shop and all the cuckoo clocks hanging on the wall, the pendulums are swinging in unison. That's not because the guy spent hours setting the cuckoo clocks. It's because hanging them on the wall, they actually communicate their vibrations to each other through the wall. And after a few hours of running at all kinds of different speeds, everything falls into step. Coupled oscillation. Women in dormitories, their menstruation falls into phase. That's a coupled biological oscillator. And you get this in many, many systems. And the problem with it is, in something like a stock market situation, is it, it then tends to amplify small perturbations into very large perturbations. And the entire system then tends to destabilize. Uh, well, that's very interesting. Next week could be major. The way the descent into novelty will work 
is there's no earth-shaking moment. For many months preceding the 25th of February, and we'll look at this tonight, but for many months preceding the 25th of February, things have become more and more locked, um, conservative, recidivist, whatever you want to call it, habitual, traditional, repetitious. Then the cusp was the 25th of February, well, but it doesn't, you don't feel the earth move. Uh, the, the 26th is not greatly different from the 25th. The 27th is slightly more different. The 28th still slightly more. But over the next two months, every day will mark a greater descent into novelty. And as I say, a worldwide economic collapse would certainly precipitate all kinds of other changes. And there's plenty of instability in the system. I mean, the Chinese are playing with the idea of world war, or at least their military are, while the political people are busy dying. Uh, once you get the internationalist rhetoric out of Marxism, what you have is national socialism. So it isn't communists that are about to return to power in Russia. It's national socialism that's about to take power in Russia. That's a terrifying possibility. Um, and then, of course, as I said, the unexpected, which can be anything from asteroid strike to technical innovation to Ebola outbreak to political assassination. Uh, these things are, uh, you know, you can bet on the unexpected. It's the safest bet in, on the table. Yeah. The, the curious thing for me, again, going back to millenarianism, is in a sense the construct is an abstraction. We are not reaching... The year 2000, in essence, means nothing. It is, the, it is the energy that we bring to it that, in a sense, creates the atmosphere for the events to take place. Well, you mean that, in the, that the year 2000 is no different from any other year? Exactly. Well, except that, if you look at the way society frames its values, one of the largest value frames that we have perhaps arguably the largest, is the calendar. And so once you accept a calendar, then its rhythms become automatic. And so here we are facing the turn of a thousand years, which you're right, in and of itself, it's nothing. But because we are psychologically driven by it, it becomes something. Mm -hmm. You can hear these politicians, if they have no rhetoric, they just use the calendar itself as a rhetorical launching pad and try to make that seem like progress. Here's a progressive program. We'll turn the millennium. Well, we're going to turn the millennium, and whether it's progressive or not, uh, there will be a lot of Christian hysteria as we approach the millennium because it's not only, well, it's their last chance. I mean, I don't think anybody believes that in uh, 3,000, Christianity will be making a major push. Uh, this is their last chance to deliver, and they are very confident of the delivery, and so there is a spreading hysteria. And of course, whenever society becomes incomprehensible, people assume that the end is near. Um, and that seems to attend that spreading social confusion. Millenarianism is inevitably, well, not inevitably, but largely a phenomenon of the displaced, the economically desperate, and uh, so forth. Yeah. Now, what, what do you think is going to happen? Is there going to be another nativistic movement or a uh, large cargo cult? I mean, what's going to happen? You mean over the next 10 years or so? Pat Buchanan? I don't think so. I think, I think Pat Buchanan is discovering the world is even more novel than he supposed. Uh, you know, if, if, if you've never won and you win, that's novel. But now it's time to win again, and it's no longer novel. You're back with the problem you had before you won the first time. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I, I'm very hopeful because as I look at large scales of time, I see that what has always been conserved is greater richness of opportunity. 
greater freedom. And the way I define the ultimate omega point in, of novelty is it must be the place where all things become possible. How could it not be that? Because that's what novelty means, is strange things being possible. Well, when all strange things are possible, you've met the novelty maxima. Well, how could such a place exist? Well, it couldn't unless you move into hyperspace or if you invent time travel or something like that. Then you break the forward momentum of linear history. But that's conceivable. I mean, in, there's no reason intrinsically why time travel is impossible. Uh, and time travel is simply a, a, a Romana cliff for uh, transformation of energy and matter on all scales. Time travel is faster than light travel. These things all become the same thing. And there is no reason why uh, these things can't be anticipated. You know, the whole purpose of data coordination, whether it's occurring in an amoeba or a mega international corporation, the purpose of data coordination is to predict the future, always. I mean, that's what your senses do for you. You know, notice when you look over there and decide to walk over there, you're also deciding to walk over then. In other words, you are coordinating data to move through time and space toward a future point. And the whole evolution of life on one level can be seen as a conquest of dimensions. You know, the earliest forms of life were, were uh, fixed slimes of some sort. And then motility motion became a possibility, but just basically groping in a linear line, uh, unable to see what is ahead of you, unable to see what you've just left, but groping, groping. Well, then over time and through evolution, uh, light-sensitive chemicals get sequestered on the surface of these organisms. And now they have a gradient that tells them where light is and they can go toward it or away from it. They are gaining dimensional sophistication. Well, from that point to the evolution of human beings, it's basically evolution works on one theme, the developing of better bodies for the conquest of three-dimensional space. So the fin turns into the leg and so forth and so on. And then finally, that's like fulfilled in higher animals. You know, the cheetah can run 70 miles an hour and so forth and so on. These are the limits of, the, of, of flesh are achieved. But then at that point, mind begins to flex its muscle and move forward. And uh, what is language but the ability to recreate the past in the present or to recreate the hypothetical in the present? In other words, in a world without language, experience is always being lost. You have it and then it goes away. If you can talk about it around the campfire and tell the stories, then the past stays with you. And uh, the ancestors accompany you on your journey through time. Well, then if you get still more sophisticated and begin to write, now not only the great myth the enduring triumphs and tragedies of your group can be kept, but all the minutia, the tax records, the tallies of crops bought and sold, the king lists, everything can be... St and now, you know, through the transformation of media electronically, we essentially, the past is a file in our world and, and the file is more and more, you know, once, when we, once we have VR, much of the past will stay around as an adjunct to the present. On the other end, end of that equation, <coughs> we have developed incredibly powerful mathematical tools for predicting and extending data into the future. 
It's terribly, terribly important. Uh, the stock market is a good example. I mean, we need to know how these markets operate in order to uh, avoid social confusion and breakdown of, of social systems. Uh, inventory theory is a place where, you know, you need to know six weeks, ten weeks out where you're going to be. Because if you're warehousing a lot of stuff, you're losing money. If you, have, if you can refine your predictive understanding of how your market operates, you can save a lot of money. You can save and make money by predicting the future. This has not been lost on anybody. And so uh, there's a great deal of interest in doing this. Well, if this is a valid uh, program of research, then its holy grail would obviously be as complete a prediction of the future as is feasible. And I think, you know, the time wave and catastrophe theory and complexity theory and these things are new techniques and new styles of trying to approach that ideal. Yeah. What constitutes something that, that clues you in and say, wait, that was a novel, that, or uh, that typifies novelty? Because the things that I've been hearing about so far have to do with like presidential elections or stock market crashes, and none of that seems very novel to me. Yeah, well, that's a good question. Novelty, uh, I think I may have mentioned this, but it's worth discussing. Novelty should never occur without its ghost concept accompanying it, which is its opposite, which is habit. In my version of how the universe works, it's a struggle between these two forces, habit and novelty. And in a period of a million years, there's a way to draw the picture of the battle. And in the last 10 minutes, there's a way to draw the picture of the battle. So what is habit? Habit is repetition of activities already accomplished. Re repetition is habit. Tradition is habit. Limited risk-taking is habit. Uh, I think you get the idea. Novelty, on the other hand, is high-risk, new, untried, strange, unusual, stands out from the surrounding environment uh, and surprises. So against God's intercession into history, Pat Buchanan's win in New Hampshire may not appear to be greatly novel, but that's not the correct scale of comparison. The correct scale of comparison is, was the expectation that he would lose. You see, so uh, habit and novelty occur in the most sublime and mundane dimensions uh, because they're, they're relative terms. They're always measured against their surround so that, you know, if you're in some incredibly constipated, ritual-dominated society and you so much as put a spot of paint on your toenail social ripples go out from this. It has to be explained, defended. What does this mean? Who does it challenge? It's a novel act against the background of such constipated expectations. On the other hand, there are societies where full-body electric uh, elective surgery won't even get a ripple from your gang when you show up at the coffee house. So uh, that's an area where uh, you know the standards of novelty and habit are different. Over large scales of time, it seems very clear to me that the story of our universe is novelty is winning. Novelty is winning. It's a very slow battle of attrition because habit is so reluctant to give ground and will take ground back. But over large scales of time, novelty is winning. That's where we come into the picture. That's why there's life on this planet. That's why there's people on this planet. That's why there's high technology on this planet. Because novelty is winning. That's one point. The other point is it, it's winning faster and faster. 
it isn't simply proceeding at the same pace. Uh, uh, what happens in a 10-year period now is orders of magnitude more connections being made than were made in a 10 or 1,000 or perhaps million year period at times in the past. And all time is, is the connections, uh, the events which fill it. In other words, if you think of a million years in absolutely empty space and ask how long, what's it like to experience a million years in absolutely empty space, it passes in an instant because nothing happened. If nothing happened, then there was no time. You know, time is defined by the events which fill it. If there are no events, time collapses into nothingness. A universe in which nothing happens is a universe that has no duration. So you need duality to have time. Yeah, yeah. It's an illusion of a lower dimensional slice of, uh, of reality. You need duality. Is it, is it a priori like I can't say? Is the du dualism a priori? It's given if that's what you mean by a priori. Uh, it's a real thing, and by that I mean, we could argue what that means, but it's a real thing in the same way that space, time, and uh, space, gravitation, and energy are real things. It's not a construct of the human mind. Uh, can, can I try my idea of the reason for the cataclysm that's fast approaching, or...? Sure. The extension of novelty. Um, let me start at the beginning. The one definition of enlightenment, one definition, one narrow definition, is the it's the uh, it's the growing together of the gap between desire and fulfillment. And I think what we have managed to accomplish with our culture is we've produced a society that is arranging for fulfillment and desire with technological uh, systems performing to their utmost to pull that off. So people are becoming fulfilled on a physical level. They're becoming enlightened technically. But there's no matching change in how they feel about themselves. So there's this horror coming over the horizon of people uh, finding themselves with everything they always wanted and feeling totally not right about it. I, if that, that to me characterizes the neighborhood I live in real well. People are going faster and faster and faster with more and more and more stuff and not feeling good about it. Uh, that if we get to the end point of that process, we come to a place where people are intensely frustrated because they've got everything but nothing is right. To me, that feels like a change of state time. Well, yeah, somehow the it's a real problem because a, a meme has gotten loose on this planet that is the social equivalent of cancer, in my opinion. And it's what it is, is it's capitalism. Capitalism does not serve human beings. It, it serves itself in the same way that cancer does not serve a human being. It serves itself. Uh, th what I mean by this is uh, th that it fetishizes objects, and it tries to tell you that certain objects will make you happy if you can possess them. Well, then you work very hard to possess them, but then you're not happy. At the same time, uh, it is... Uh, raising these expectations in the hearts and minds of millions and millions of people that it knows it can't deliver to. There, you, if you cut all the rainforests and dug all the metals, you couldn't deliver the middle-class American lifestyle to the population of the planet. And the effort to do so would wreck the entire ecological system. So. Uh, Capitalism either has to transform itself from within because no human being or institution can oppose it, or there has to come 
uh, some force from the outside which will break it down. I don't, I don't know what that could be unless it would be a revulsion over what the cost of practicing capitalism is. Uh, in other words, if we could create... And this is a job for media. The media has basically hoarded itself to the capitalist agenda uh, and knows no way out. The media in the naive era, before all this stuff was figured out, was assumed to educate and inform the citizens so that rational decisions could be made. That's not what it's about now. Now it's to distort, manipulate, delude, and mislead. Um, what is needed is a rediscovery of inner wealth. This is, again, the psychedelic thing. The reason people fetishize objects is because they have no accessible dimension of inner worth. They feel worthless without the Ferrari and the cuisine art and whatever this object is that they're into. Once you take psychedelics, you discover that you are shabby stuff compared to the inner wealth of your own imagination. But unless you know that, you will always want after that stuff. So my hope is, and it seems to accompany psychedelic use, I think, uh, less interest in material possessions. Not that people dress in hair shirts and wander the byways, but I think people who take psychedelics make and lose money in a considerably more relaxed fashion uh, than people who don't. Yeah. There, there are several sources of such an enlightenment that is inner wealth versus external wealth. One of them is trauma. A lot of families who lose a son or daughter or nearly lose one rediscover what their values are. Right. The um, psychedelic one is a very common one. I mean, and it's, since it's at a single moment, it's often recognized as the source. I think oftentimes people do have that kind of enlightenment, but the source is hard to find or it happens gradually. Psychedelia, I mean, someone can come down from the first acid trip and go, wow. I see my values like I didn't see them before. I'm quitting my job. I've had it. What other experiences, you know, I'm trying to broaden the category besides trauma and psychedelia and perhaps the forces of losing all that you're worth. Like it's people lose in a stock market and they jump out a window or they go, hey, I've got choices I didn't see before. I don't have to like defend my castle anymore. Well, the two other things are near-death experience. That brings that forces you to figure out what you really give a hoot about. <clears throat> and the other, I think, a little pleasanter than the near-death experience, is travel. Yeah. You know? Go, go live in Benares for a year and then see how this looks to you. It's not for nothing that we call these psychedelic experiences trips. Uh, the, the only thing I know that changes people the way psychedelics do is travel. And I don't mean this sanitized, bullshit, first-class, United Airlines, three-star hotel travel. <laughs> I mean, you know, the real thing, down and dirty. Uh, live like the people do if you can stand it. I mean, it's very, very difficult. I've lived with Amazon tribes. and. You know, you're there and you're having this experience and you're thinking to yourself, everybody in my culture would wish to be with these people. These are the real, original people. Now, if they just stop throwing puppies in the fire, maybe we could sit down and enjoy their company. Uh, you know, it's, it's not easy. It tests your values. So how can you bring a Western mind into a third world, uh, third world nation where there, where many are fully willing to trade what environmental treasures they have for the goods of capitalism. How can you say, well, psychedelics will put you in in touch with, you know, values that you don't need? Coca-Cola. I had an experience in Thailand, in, um, they're actually up, probably up in Burma, where I stopped by the village hunter shack and. You know, every manner of endangered beast was chained for sale, and um, I, you know, was, I was astounded at all you know, these beautiful parrots that he was selling for a dollar. And he bought one of these parrots, you know, the healthiest one, set it free. He looks at me like I'm crazy and goes to the village store to buy cigarettes. With, how can you, how can you bring, 
how can we stop the bartering of the environment for capitalism? Can can we bring psychedelics to that? Or any other experience? Yeah, well, I don't know. Yeah. Not even a, another observation on exactly that point, and that is the absence of wealth is ruining the environment. The absence of wealth ruins the environment. For example, when you, you know, land in New Delhi and you and the door opens on the airplane, the first thing you get overwhelmed with is the air is unbreathable because of smoke. Well, you know, the reason that a picture from that smoke exists is because of what the people used to cook with. The, the rest of it is because of the cheap autos that they use. So, I mean, it's the absence of wealth that makes the air unbreathable. Yes, I'm not advocating poverty. I'm advocating something more like simplicity. Uh, I, uh, like, well, let me describe my lifestyle to you, so which sort of then is a statement about what I'm trying to do. Uh, I, I live in Hawaii, up a terrible road, with no telephone in, but I have a wireless modem out and I have an excellent Mac, and I don't make any, I don't believe in the distinction between nature and technology. I am happiest when I am totally immersed in nature with the best technology available. And uh, most things I care about are immaterial. I mean, I have books, but they re it's the information in them that is represented. The electricity is generated from solar. Uh, some of the food is grown on site. More will be. But it's not like a back to the land movement or anything like that. It's very casual. It seems the natural way to live. Uh, one thing that the internet holds out for many, many people is the end of the entire cycle based on the concept of office culture and commuting. Uh, most people who work in offices don't need to go to the office now. And the momentum continues to have commuting and so forth. But when these corporations realize how much money they could save by telling people to stay home, uh, office culture is just going to dissolve overnight. Well, then... Uh, something like 65% of all automobile travel is in the pursuit of moving to and from the job. Uh, that could all be eliminated. Uh, I think the, the internet is the physical analog to the psychedelics. Until the internet arose, it was very hard for me to see um, how we were going to get from here to the omega point. Now I have no problem. It's all in place. I mean, the internet has to grow faster. It has to, the bandwidth has to be expanded. The codes have to be simplified. The protocols have to be simplified. And everybody has to be brought online. When that happens, I think uh, there will be a kind of natural reorganization of society. Because what we're living in and this is a McLuhanist rap, what we're living in is a linear print-created world. It was created by printheads. They couldn't help themselves. They thought they were normal human beings, but they were very, very dramatically distorted by their relationship to typography. And they created this kind of world. Well, now we're moving into the era of electronic culture. And all kinds of phenomena associated with the old way of doing things are going to disappear. For example, uh, a quality of print culture was the phenomenon called mass media. Mass media is finished. It doesn't make any sense anymore. Uh, uh, mass media is one-to-many communication. And what the Internet offers is any-to-any -any communication. You know, we all have contempt, or I assume we do, or mild contempt, for the tabloid newspapers that we see when we check through the grocery store. Elf, or, or dwarf rapes none, flees in UFO. Uh, that kind of thing. Well, but now let's think about the New York Times for a moment. The New York Times is designed 
for what? To be read by millions of people. Who would want to read something designed to be read by millions of people? The very nature of the goal indicates that there will be very little there for you. Uh, all, only to the degree that you share some interests with all these other millions of people. And many of these interests are artificially created by the media. So uh, other notions that were put in place by print. Print, I think, did I mention this last night about the interchangeability of type? How I didn't, okay. Type, as you know, is interchangeable. Manuscript is not. That simple notion of the interchangeability of the subunits of a technology permit two incredible things in our world. Uh, the idea of the citizen, the citizen, and uh, the idea of the unique individual. And also, modern industrial techniques of manufacture. The assembly line is essentially where you build things the way you print things. You assemble the parts, you assemble the small parts and cr create completed objects. So this notion that stresses uniformity, interchangeability, and co-equality of subunits creates the entire political and social ambiance of the post-Renaissance mind. Now, something entirely different is happening. Uh, the new media is non-linear. It, it uh, doesn't require uh, lockstep uh, acquiescence in a model of behavior. That's why fringe elements which were kept very much at the fringe through the reign of print, have in the 20th century broken out and managed to set the agenda of much of society. So things, uh, things like surrealism, jazz, uh, ethnic consciousness, uh, homosexuality, different styles of dissent have in the 20th century all gained a great deal more prominence as the print culture gave way to the electronic culture. And in the future, I think uh, these enormous structures which we're asked to participate in are just going to fade away like national governments. I think basically we're going to live in a world which has only two levels, the local level, basically your watershed and the planetary level. And the systems of control that lie between those two levels will be very thin and, and, uh, and invisible. S uh, a tremendous leveling of information takes place. The print game is a game of privilege. Information confers power and if you have it, you hold it. The electronic game uh, is a game where all information is equally accessible and shareable, and it creates a different and more egalitarian information field. Uh, 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 and capitalism contributes to this to some degree. I am not entirely anti-capitalistic. I think it needs to be tamed. Uh, but, but capitalism contributes to this. For ex what I mean by that is, Think of how governments deal with information. They classify everything top secret and then they hold it. And, well, what is the effect of that? It slows invention. It slows novelty. Well, how does capitalism deal with new information, new technologies? You get it to market as fast as you possibly can in order to ace the competition. In, in the capitalist set of rules, if you have a proprietary technology, to keep it secret is insane. How will you make any money if you keep it secret? You must tell it. So uh, capitalism itself has become a force for novelty. This is what, you know, when people started coming out of the Soviet Union as it collapsed, this is what blew their minds completely about the West, was the diversity and abundance I remember some Russians uh, 
came to me uh, once, I don't know, five years ago or so when the Soviet Union was collapsing. And, and we, I was driving them around and showing them the scene, and I pointed to an A and P, and I said, you can get any food you want in there. And the guy said, oh, come on. And I said, name a food. You can get it in there. He said, tangerines, like it was a knockout punch. <laughs> no problem, they got tangerines stacked waist deep. And anything else you can imagine. So capitalism produces this enormous abundance, uh, but without very much ethical concern for the process by which it's done or the consequences for the users and the environment. In the business world, especially in the software world, I see large companies in the business of purchasing novelty and then producing novelty. That is, less and less companies have R&D institutions within them. They let the innovation happen at these little tiny companies, and they go back to the tiny companies. That's because they don't want those long-haired, dope-smoking weirdos actually inside their corporate structure. Yeah. You can hire them as consultants, because then you can can them at will. <laughs> but for God's sake, don't get them on the medical plan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> article in a magazine and had an IBM, a fellow from IBM, he had a suit on and everything, and someone accused IBM of being weak in the multimedia market, where multimedia represents new and novel. And he says, oh, we have some guys with uh, earrings and long hair here. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's defense. <laughs> Yes, well, one of the amusing things about the computer revolution and capitalism and all that is that technology has evolved so quickly that the people running capitalism from the top no longer understand the tools that are necessary for it. They have to pay guys with ponytails and, and piercings to turn on the machines every morning. And that must be very terrifying to them that... Well, but it was always the case. They didn't dig the oil wells either. Mm. But the guys who dug the oil wells, I don't think, carried an entirely different analysis of society. I mean, they were, there were class differences, but these long-haired people are essentially, you're trading with the enemy if you're a corporation who uses these people. And every corporation must use them because they're the smart people. Uh, uh, they will use them. Uh, and all I'm saying is, is that capital will move wherever it can exploit information. And if now the information resides there, that's where they'll go to exploit that information for the continuing process of the economic machine. So even though we may be looking at, at something novel, ultimately when that source is exhausted, they'll move on to whatever else they have to move on to to maintain themselves. Well, no technology in history has ever been put in place with any clear understanding of what its implications would be. Uh, that's what we find out later. <laughs> and uh, I think the Internet uh, probably will turn out to be very toxic for capitalism. Uh, when objects can be made of light, when a Ferrari costs as much as a Buick, uh, because they're both made out of the same material, uh, all of this class structure based on fetishization of objects is going to disappear. It's interesting that the, both Pac-Bell and AT&T announced that they'd be getting the internet game. You know, a little late, but not too late. But they've been late on delivery because they can't get the staff to build what they want to build. So they can't find any mason workers to put their highways together, and it's costing them billions. And I think AT&T actually even has to back that. Well, AT&T is going to set up a system of satellites that are going to give ISDN speed to every man, woman, and child on this planet by pointing straight up at the sky, avoiding all these mafias of these local phone companies. <laughs> the, the curious thing, I think, in, in terms of the social implication uh, of the electronic age is the possibility of almost a pure form of democracy independent of bureaucratic structure. In other words, that there's the possibility that people can arrive at consensus unmanaged. This is what's called electronic tribalism, that we can remove all these interpretive filters and structures and methods, the representative, the parliament, the election, all of that 
can be done away with and that we can actually, and they hate that. It was very interesting in the last presidential campaign, I don't know if you picked up on it, but only Perot spoke for this, you know, he has this idea of these electronic town meetings. Well, of course, Perot represents a, a, a not mainstream point of view from the point of view of the Republicans and the Democrats. They both just piled onto that. They hate that. Uh, the idea of real democracy is as threatening to the politicians of this country as it is to the Chinese leadership. Uh, I mean, they do not want the will of the people. Uh, to be expressed, but I, I think as we cohere into a single organism, there will be less and less need for these 18th century institutions that we have put in place and maintain uh, with the power of the gun. Yeah. I see a couple of possible paths that the, the effect that the new media is going to have on people could go. One would follow the model of what happened to uh, Europe when the church stopped becoming the sole interpreter of, uh, of the Bible and the Bible became something that was printed and that anybody could read and interpret, and many people did, and started different interpretations. And that sort of caused an explosion of different ideas and you know, different ways of looking at the world. The other would be, this is a little more difficult to express, but there's a terrific Buddhist magazine called Tricycle Magazine. And one of the things that's really terrific about it is it's non-sectarian, that it has a whole lot of viewpoints. It talks about all sorts of different uh, different flavors of Buddhism that people respect because there aren't enough really Buddhists in America to have really cool magazines for all these different sects. Now, if that were to change tomorrow and there was a different magazine for every sect, then each magazine would have a single viewpoint. The other viewpoint would be portrayed maybe, but as seen as kind of heresy and talked down about. And I can see that sort of thing happening on the web, where, or with the web-like media, where if people start pursuing ideas that they're interested in and they care about, they may end up digging themselves a niche of their own preconceptions and their own, you know, the, the prejudices that they already have about information, and going to information sources that support that and <coughs> prop up things which may or may not be valid. The other option is that they could be exposed to so many different types of information from from the original sources, not filtered through a mass media, that they'll actually become more informed about more different points of view. And I can't tell right now which way it's going to go, or maybe no. it's going to go in both directions for different people. You can't keep ignorant ignorant because there's too much access to the other knowledge. Only if you only if you want it, though. It's not like now. No. Today, if you turn on CNN. You you get not only the information you're interested in, you get information that CNN thinks a large audience of people is going to be interested in. So you're inevitably going to be confronted with things that uh, mess with your, pre your prejudices. Uh, now, the downside of this is that what's happening is CNN is mapping the societal prejudice of its market share onto all of its audience. And because there are so few media sources, there are a few selected branches of prejudice that you're allowed to tap into. But whether the future is going to break that up or just mean that there are going to be tighter groups and smaller groups of predispositions that are reinforced. After that's a choice. Those that wish to insulate themselves in only the information they want to see that supports their narrow worldview will insulate themselves excellently. And those which wish to um, just throw themselves into the unknown constantly will have a ready available source of the unknown. Yeah, I think we're already seeing this. I mean, the V-chip, is that what it's called? This thing that lets you control what your kids can access on the Internet. All this concern about pornography and so forth and so on. Uh, clearly, some people are going to take the Internet raw and love it, and other people are just going to want the conference on cat grooming and, and so forth and so on. Uh, there's, there's nothing we can do about that. I mean, this is not a new problem. Let me recall to you that hundreds of millions of people in the world lead larval, low-awareness lives. Not, I'm not talking about the poor, unwashed. Uh, uh, I'm talking about people who watch TV six and seven hours a day. That's a drug. And those people have chosen to check out of the historical adventure and just live in this miasma of pop culture. And we can decry the loss to them of, of awareness and so forth and so on, 
But on the other hand, it's, it makes it easier for the rest of us, I think. I mean, I don't want all those people running around on the freeway and standing in front of me at the grocery store. And, you know, better they should be home watching, uh, you know, uh, whatever it is these people watch. Uh, and people will make these kinds of choices. And, you know, it will become more and more extreme. I mean, if you want 24-hour-a-day teledildonic pornography, Who's to say you shouldn't have this? But what it, how it will affect your performance as a citizen, I don't know. I mean, it's just like mainlining heroin or something else. People have to make choices. But the fact that they will sometimes make bad choices is no argument ever for limiting their choices. You know, you have to come to political bedrock with this. Are you a control freak or do you believe in the dignity of human nature? If you trust human nature, then your politics should be one of always removing control because control suppresses human nature. If, on the other hand, you're freaked out about human nature and you think that if we don't have laws, everybody will turn to cannibalism, sodomy, and cocaine, then, of course, you want everybody has to be leaned on and so forth and so on. But if you don't have faith in human nature, that's a pretty existential situation to be in because where do you put your faith then? It's possible that we'll fall into, I'll use your number, 5%. A situation where 95% are looking for novelty and 5% will produce it. And that the 5% who enjoy making novelty will make just what they want and find a narrow category of people who will find it. Well, that's sort of, people say, what should be done or what should we do besides take psychedelics? And I say, you cannot escape the media, you cannot escape the internet, you cannot escape our dilemma. You have two choices. You can consume or you can produce. That's it. And the people who consume are lost souls and we all consume and in those moments when we consume we are lost souls we we need to produce and what we produce is art art is the greatest era of art in the history of the human race is dawning right now if we produce images and text from the heart we will uh, we will compete with these very large network channels called capitalism, communism, so forth and so on. In a sense, one way to think about the internet is it's a 40 million channel TV hookup. 40 million 5 .5. channels, 5.5 now. Well, but however many websites there are right now is what I'm thinking of. Uh, and, uh, and so no one need feel isolated. And isolation has traditionally been a political tool for disempowering people. If you can make people feel isolated, you can make them shut up. So, uh, you know, if someone, let's say, is a communist and lives in some tiny town in North Dakota, in the past, their tendency, I think, would be to keep their mouth shut. But since they're getting 400 email messages a day from fellow communists and being informed of conferences going on constantly and huge FTP sites and all kinds of things, then they just say, that's my community and I'm willing to talk about it. They are no longer isolated. And this has empowered all kinds of fringe points of view. Some you may approve of, some you may not. But I approve of the concept of the fringe in and of itself. And then I figure, you know, the memes can sort themselves out through natural selection. But if a meme doesn't ever get onto the playing field where the competition is happening, then it is not fairly dealt with and can die without having its proper opportunity to, to impact. We were taking away the advantage of, a bit of the leading memes in their ability to suppress the new oncoming memes, like a marketplace where if I try to start an oil company today, I have a difficult time because the main players would disadvantage me and handicap me. Right. In case you reverse handicapping where the small ones would have an advantage to come in. This worldwide web is it just seems to be changing the nature of gravity, or at least the way I thought that these various physical forces always were. And um, 
suddenly time, which I understand is relative, is getting speeded up simply because I'm being barraged with so much information from so many different places and it stops being a matter of um, trying to be smart um, by assimilating all this information and becomes more of a, of a case of trying to be smart by seeing what I can leave alone, what I can distance myself, or what I can funnel out because there's there's so much of it. And well, I think we haven't quite learned how to use it yet, and also it isn't quite what it should be yet. It's maddening to try and function on it at 14.4 or 28.8. Everybody needs ISDN or faster. The people who use it most successfully, the way they live is usually they do it through laptops. And it's just always on. I mean, what you need is 24-hour-a-day ISDN connection. It's always on. And so as you think, questions arise and you set your info bots going. Your elves, you send them into the matrix and they return with these bits of information. So as the day passes and your internal dialogue proceeds, you're constantly having messengers arrive with data which clarifies your understanding uh, of the situation. Uh, so I think of it, it, what it will clearly become is it's just an adjunct to your mind. And when the laptop disappears and the whole thing becomes a subdermal implant or something, then you'll just say, gee, I wonder what the gross national product of Sri Lanka is this year. And then we'll say, the gross national product of Sri Lanka this year was, and you will be provided with this uh, information. I mean, obviously there have to be filters and a certain level of sophistication, but never before in history have people been able to have a dialogue in real time with their own cultural database. And uh, uh, the quality of decisions is directly dependent of, on the quality of the information upon which the decisions are based. And uh, in the past, good quality information is very hard to come by. The mass media is for the peasants. The guys above the 50th floor, and guys it is, as you know, uh, they read special newsletters. They uh, receive feed from certain think tanks. They deal with an entirely different kind of information than you do privileged information, managerial information, leader information. Well, now that's all changing. Uh, sitting without telephone lines in Hawaii at the keyboard of my computer, I have better intelligence than Stansfield Turner had when he was director of the CIA for Jimmy Carter. And I'm Joe Nobody, you know, Earth Citizen One. Uh, so that shows you how quickly the quality of information is improving. What you do with this is, of course, has always been uh, an individual dilemma. The psychedelics, to my mind, were a great anticipation of the Internet. It probably never would have been built had there not been psychedelics, even though it was built by terminal paranoids because you know it was built as a command and control system for thermal nuclear war and they were but the wonder of that was that they built it uh, so that it could not be destroyed not realizing that what that meant was that they could not destroy it you know, it has no central control. There is no board you bomb, no plug you pull. So they built this indestructible thing, and now it's loose and growing and unstoppable and uh, possibly leads to uh, the, form the reformulation of, of the nature of humanity, which would be then an interesting process. Thermonuclear war leads to an enormous paranoid response, which leads to the internet, which leads to liberation. I've always felt that atomic weapons were an enormous IQ booster for the human race. 
And when you think about the fact that a, tri a global tribe of carnivorous monkeys have possessed thermonuclear delivery systems for 50 years and only twice were they ever used, I think it must have sobered us immeasurably because there were many issues in those years where had there not been thermonuclear bombs, there would have been war. And, mm -hmm. and so it, it became a kind of inoculation against war because it was so horrible and it forced the human race, I wouldn't go so far as to say grow up, but it propelled us at least into adolescent awareness mm -hmm. of, our, uh, of our dilemma.